All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Leo. Um, we're very happy to uh, to have you uh, with us today. Um, basically, we'll be uh, having a discussion uh, today about uh, the new technology uh, trends uh, with a benchmark between Europe and Asia Pacific. Uh, very, very excited to uh, have you come online uh, and uh, have a fantastic lineup of experts with me today. Um, maybe quickly uh, about me, I'm the founder of Australians uh, and we and co-founder of Startup and Angel, which originally was an event series we started back in 2016 to gather founders, um, to be entrepreneurs, investors and innovation leaders. Uh, in, across Asia Pacific, uh, we've now run uh, a number of uh, uh, of events, uh, basically over forty physical editions, and this is our fifth online edition. Um, basically, the ambition here is obviously to share knowledge, uh, inspire some of you in this uh, difficult difficult time, and gather our community in a time where more than ever we need to uh, stay connected. Um, a lot of the discussion today is going to be talking about obviously working from home, uh, you know, potentially some of the more kind of negative impact uh, this outbreak has had. Uh, you know, for um, my company, for our company, Australians, it's been now eight weeks uh, since we uh, left the office. Uh, you know, we've been obviously uh, adjusting, I imagine, like a number of you. Um, and uh, I think it's also the, the opportunity to. Uh, you know, in a more digital world, uh, actually look at what trends have appeared uh, or what trends have actually been accelerated uh, by uh, this scenario. Um, so I would uh, love to uh, give uh, more opportunity to uh, our um, guest speakers to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, you know, I'll just kind of mention, uh, basically we, we launched our online community just less than five weeks ago, uh, we've got, uh, I think, just over 220 members uh, who joined. Uh, you know, a number of you are currently attending online. Um, most of our uh, members are actually now sitting in Australia, Singapore, uh, Southeast Asia. We've got a couple from uh, emerging markets, you know, including Papua New Guinea, uh, Indonesia. Um, today, basically, with this event, kind of focusing on uh, Europe, we are welcoming a number of you, uh, you know, to uh, to join our network. Um, I would also like to mention big, big thank you to Axeleo, uh, the VC firm uh, that is uh, operating B two B rocks in uh, in Paris, in particular, uh, has been pretty instrumental, uh, kind of putting this event together. So big thanks to uh, to Quentin and and Eric in Paris. Uh, you know, feel free to jump in the in the chat. You know, um, give a bit more insights around uh, you know Axelio and what's happening with the French tech ecosystem. Uh, I would like also to say a big thanks to uh, OVH Cloud. Uh, so we'll have Lionel today uh, kind of uh, talk on their behalf, uh, but they've been a long-term supporter uh, of Startup and Angel, you know, over the last year, and uh, it's really really appreciated. Uh, we've been able to travel with them, um, you know, in Sydney, Melbourne, uh, and Singapore, uh, you know, over the last 12 months. So it's been an amazing journey. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, OVH Cloud. Um, and now it's my uh, my great pleasure to um, invite uh, Alexandra from uh, Artesian, maybe to uh, say a few words, uh, you know, introduce, uh, introduce yourself uh, and what Artesian does. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ali Quinnies Ross. Um, I work as part of the investment team at Artesian. Um, Artesian is an alternative asset manager. Uh, we started in 2004 and we have both a fixed income business and a venture capital business. Um, I work on the venture capital side of the business. Um, we have about $400 million under management with um, our money in um, Australia, and we also have a fund in China where we're investing um, in Chinese-based companies as well as across Southeast Asia. Um, Artesian is an early stage venture capital fund. So we invest in companies from um, the pre-seed stage um, through to Series A, Series B, um, and Series C. 
um, but we like to invest as early as possible. Uh, we have three sectors that we're focused on. These are medical technology, um, agricultural and food technology, and clean energy. Um, these sectors are aligned to macro issues, so we think that um, health and an aging population, um, climate change, uh, and food security and supply chains are gonna be big issues that the world will face in future. So that's why we have focused on those. Um, and about 40% of our portfolio is focused on those sectors. Um, I personally look after our clean energy sector. Um, so have, have a focus on investments um, in Australia in that, in that sector. Thanks, Leo. Thanks so much, uh, Ali. Uh, I'll now uh, invite uh, Andre uh, from Aircore um, to uh, introduce himself. Uh, welcome, Andre. Thanks, Leo, and welcome, welcome everyone. Thanks, Ali, too. Um, well, I, I'm actually talking to you right now based from based from sunny Paris. Uh, I can see behind most of you it's a bit dark, uh, so I'm, I'm in Europe. Um, I'm Director of Sales at Aircall. So for those of you who don't know Aircall, we're a cloud-based phone system which seamlessly integrates with the um, best CRMs and help desks on the market with the likes of Salesforce, HubSpot, Intercom, Zendesk, and many others. And uh, yeah, I think we'll probably have a, a lot to talk about as, uh, as cloud-based food systems have become uh, a big, big uh, thing with this uh, whole working from home period. So, so I look forward to the chat. Thanks, Leo. You're welcome, uh, Andre. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you will be uh, able to contribute, you know, given your, uh, the range of markets also you are, you know, your company is, uh, is covering. Thanks a lot. So we'll also uh, have uh, Gilles, the co-founder and CEO of uh, Lighton. Hi, Gilles. Hi, thank you for having me. So uh, my name is Gilles, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lifestorm. I'm also based in Paris, as you can see from the light coming in down the window. And um, so Lifestorm, for the ones who don't know, we're actually a video communication platform which enables you to do meetings and webinars up to thousands of people right from your browser without having to download anything. And um, we also enable you to cover everything regarding event promotion, marketing, retargeting around webinars. So not just the streaming, but everything else around webinars and meetings. So landing pages, email sequences, integrations, and so on and so forth. So it's an all-in-one video communication platform, should I say. So, yeah, and um, so obviously things have been going pretty great for us lately and um, we had a tons of learning and feedback. So um, happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gilles, and hopefully next time we'll be using Lifetime to run those events. Um, and last but not least, uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Lionel, uh, sitting in uh, sunny Melbourne. Um, to tell us a bit more about his role within the OVH Cloud. Thank you, thank you, Leo. So yes, I'm Lionel Legros, I'm based in Australia, and I'm the general manager for OVH uh, Cloud in Asia Pacific. Um, in a nutshell, OVH Cloud is um, a global cloud provider. Uh, we are not part of the top 10 um, global cloud, and we are the, the European alternative on the cloud market. So what we do, we deliver, I mean, cloud infrastructure solution to uh, 1.5 million of customers now around the world through 30 data centers. And uh, on my side, I'm leading the business and the operation on three different markets, uh, the Australian market, uh, Southeast Asia, and the Indian market as well. OK, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Lionel, and all uh, for, for the, the, the timely uh, introduction. Um, so I think yeah, we the way we kind of structured this, uh, this discussion today is uh, to give each of our experts, you know, uh, an opportunity to talk about the um, the key trends they, they are currently observing, you know, in their industry and among their customer and geographies, uh, so we can identify, you know, if um, there is any uh, differences between, you know, the European and the Asia Pacific markets. That's one and two. Um, you know what, you know what are these trends that are emerging, accelerating. Um, so I'll now uh, share a couple of slides um, from OVH uh, around and, and, and let you, uh, like Lionel, save, uh, present them. Yeah. 
Um, so um, if we talk about uh, the remote working trends, I think everyone knows that uh, yeah, uh, the remote working has become a standard for a like never before. And uh, um, as a matter of urgency, companies have had to deploy uh, new digital tools very quickly um, in order to adapt you know, and maintain their business continuity. And to do this, uh, many companies have opted for third-party solution um, this will be available online. Uh, but my point is that quick choice can sometimes uh, be detrimental, you know, to, to both the digital security and the autonomy of the company. Um, so when it comes, um, I mean, to have a chat with your family, for example, it doesn't matter which solution you are, you are using. Um, but when it comes to your strategic data, um, this is an important point to consider. And specifically in this um, in this period of crisis, um, I mean the notion of sovereignty um, has proven to be crucial right now. I'm thinking, you know, to the fight between China, US, and Europe. And um, so I think over the uh, we will see on the on the mid and long terms um, what will be the price, you know, of this uh, of this technical choice. And, and just one example to 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 explain uh, um, the topics is that um, right now, for example, on the COVID safe application, you know, using geolocalization and Bluetooth, um, um, it has been very easy for some government to deploy this kind of application. Here in Australia, if I'm right, uh, in less than 24 hours, more than 3 million downloads from the Australian residents, in less than seven days, 6 million uh, start to use the application. Um, in Singapore, they decided to, to launch the first application using Bluetooth. And two weeks ago, they updated the application to use a QR code solution. When you enter in a public place, you need to, you need to scan a QR code with your smartphone. With your smartphone. And um, in front of that, um, mainly in Europe, um, the data privacy is becoming um, the, you know, a huge concern for the European citizen and the European government. And I'm thinking right now, you know, to the you apply the French government, I think it's the same in UK, um, who is fighting with, with Apple to modify uh, the privacy and the security setting uh, on the Apple device um, to build an app which is compatible with the European data protection. You know? And um, I think that's very important for um, to be able also to build a, a European ecosystem of tech player. Um, I mean, sharing the value that can guarantee um, the fundamentals right for, for businesses. That's a huge difference between uh, um, Asia right now and, and, and Europe. The second, the second trend that uh, I can see, if you can change the, the slide, uh, Leo, please, um, is um, um, how we, we can deliver. Um, we, we know that all the, all the businesses are, are moving to the digital, but how to deliver um, a promise uh, when we are operating in a digital world. Um, Especially during the crisis, all the digital services and e-commerce uh, companies are booming. But what we need to keep in mind is um, the digital services um, growth is only possible with an infrastructure growth. Um, few example, the e-commerce, like everywhere around the world, in April, the e-commerce transactions in Australia are breaking records. But um, due to, for example, the cancellation of the number of uh, internal flights or the country, some companies are struggling for, for the delivery. And that's exactly the same uh, on the digital services. Um, the gaming industry is growing at 30% in a month in April. Uh, but uh, giants such as like, NVIDIA was not able to deliver um, the European customers, for example, before I did more capacity on the gaming. Um, internally, in OVH, we had to manage also some, um, some uh, uh, some peak, um, more than 1,600 uh, uh, more connection on the conf call solution uh, than usi uh, usually. And um, my point is that all those digital services are based on the physical infrastructures, on the network, on servers that we need to maintain, that we need to build. And um, the last example is that internally in OVH, we build usually 700 servers you know, per, per day. Uh, and during the COVID, we had to increase the production from 700 to 1,000 servers per day. And in the meantime, manage the health and safety of our teams. So definitely, it's a, it's a huge challenge uh, because what we can have also is that between uh, I mean, Asia and Europe, all the government have a different definition about critical business. Uh, is the supply chain, is the industry uh, department considered as a critical business, but we need to support, you know, the, the digital services. Um, so my point is more to say that, yeah, yeah it's possible, but um, 
Usually, we, we like to say that a company is scalable um, because they use flexible infrastructures. But my point is also that um, sometimes we need to have, I mean, the full control of the value chain or, or the full control of our data. Um, and if we stay, I mean, free or open with no technology locking, uh, or thanks to the multi-render strategy, it helps to reduce this kind of dependency. Uh, and uh, so I think yeah, that's three, very, um, three um, important points uh, to be sure that our business um, will be and, and, and will remain you know, scalable also. Fantastic. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Lionel. I think it, it brings another perspective, you know, as you mentioned, because we often, you know, we start up and, you know, especially SaaS company talk about scalability. Uh, you know, it's going to be uh, interesting to see if, uh, you know, what does, did that mean for uh, Lifestorm in particular? Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, software or, you know, a telecommunication uh, can face the same issue we had with uh, toilet paper. Um, but, uh, you know, luckily, uh, yeah. it was not that <laughs> bad. Um, okay, fantastic. So now I'll, I'll, I'll probably give uh, Ali uh, the opportunity to, uh, to give us, you know, across the zone and uh, uh, portfolio, uh, what are some of the key trends she's been observing and potentially investing in? Thanks, Leo. Um, I guess, you know, over the last three months, um, we've really seen a change um, in the trends and in the portfolio companies that are that are coming um, through our pipeline. I guess um, we've seen a sort of immediate um, response to COVID. And then we also expect to see a delayed response. So I kind of want to um, talk about those those two different um, trends and the two different cycles that um, come from that. So um, initially, obviously, we've seen an acceleration um, of, of certain technology trends that already existed, um, but they've obvious the barrier to entry has been reduced. Um, it's easier to acquire customers for these sorts of companies because. Um, individuals have had to adopt technology. Uh, they, they previously um, didn't need to or, or needed to be convinced to adopt such technologies. Um, so I guess the ones that we're looking at um, in terms of there's, we've, we're seeing a lot of um, innovation in sort of cloud computing as Lionel talked about, um, in terms of the public cloud and private cloud computing hybrid um, the hybrid cloud as well. Um, we're also starting to see um, automation technologies uh, really come to fruition. These um, automation technologies um, and, and sort of the digitization of the B2B uh, SaaS technologies, these have really taken off. So they've seen an increase in their user base um, exponentially over the last few months. Um, there's a, obviously a need for communication. Um, so and any uh, B2B SaaS uh, platform that allows for communication, that allows for workflow. Um, we've seen in terms of looking at the sort of big end of town, Zoom's user base in March increased, um, it increased to the same, it exceeded what their 200, 2019 numbers were. So um, there's an increase in demand. There was um, a 500% increase in teams in terms of chat and calls in China between March and February. Um, and GoToMeeting has had a daily spike of, of 20%. So um, communication tools are really important. Um, and, and we also expect to see these um, to remain sticky post uh, the crisis. I think we've had to, um, corporations have had to adapt to, um, to our new our new environment, um, you know, there's obviously an increase in unemployment. Will we see those? Um, will we see those people rehired, or will the companies become more innovative and more efficient? So, um, we expect a lot of these B two B platforms to be um, automation platforms to be to be quite sticky post um, post COVID. The other element is in in supply chain. Um, you know, supply chains have been completely disrupted. Um, people aren't able to travel. Um, you know, we've had to, instead of moving offshore, people are moving people back onshore. Um, and there's a real automation um, and a real push in supply chains around robotics, 3D printing. Um, we think that we'll see a real increase in the efficiency in these sectors as well. Um, a lot of those companies I mean, we've got companies that we've invested in in the 3D printing space. They've 
reacted really well and are now um, make, um, creating PPE um, equipment. So um, they, they're making face masks, they've, they've adapted to this scenario. But yeah, we think that we're gonna have less people um, in the manufacturing um, process and this will be more automated. Um, and we're already seeing some of our companies um, really try to automate their manufacturing processes. Um, I guess the other elements that we're, we're looking at is, you know, there's a real rise in telehealth. Um, companies, uh, any telehealth company, um, you, if you Google, they've, they've uh, got, they've increased exponentially over the last few months in Australia. Um, so people are, don't wanna go to the doctor. They don't wanna expose themselves um, to, to the virus or to, to the um, doctor's surgery of that environment. So they're looking to um, see their doctor online. There's companies that are doing prescription delivery. Um, everything is automated. You don't have to um, go out your door to, to reach these uh, services anymore. Um, and I guess the last one is sort of supply chain, um, uh, sorry, uh, last mile delivery. So we're seeing an increase, those sorts of companies that are doing last mile delivery. There's a lot of innovation. I mean, there are fleets out there that, um, for example, the taxi industry that have a huge fleet um, that uh, is not being utilized at the moment. So can they be plugged into the last mile delivery when we need our groceries um, delivered? We need um, prescription medication and any, any sort of things that avoid going to the shop. So we're seeing those sorts of trends come, come in immediately. Um, I guess we also as a firm are looking for the future um, of technology and, and a real shift in innovation post the crisis. Um, we expect that the increase in unemployment will actually create a new wave of entrepreneurs. Um, there will be companies, obviously startups that will go out of business. Um, so second time founders might, might look to pivot into a new sector. Um, we don't know what that innovation will look like yet. So we're expecting within the sort of next six to 12 months to see those companies start um, to look for funding um, for these concepts. You know, there's a little bit of a delay as they as they react to, um, to the, the new world that we live in. Um, yeah, so there's obviously the impact that we've seen straight up and then the impact that will be delayed and um, innovations that we, we are yet to uh, predict as well. All right, thank, thank you so much, uh, Ali. I think you, uh, um, you know, you, you covered a lot of ground. So uh, th thanks very much for that. And, uh, you know, we sure have uh, some very uh, interesting uh, questions flowing from the, uh, from the attendees uh, in the Q&A section. So uh, as we come, um, you know, further in the discussion, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, I'll then, uh, you know, give an opportunity to uh, to Gilles, uh, you know, one of the happy uh, happy few, to uh, tell us a bit about, you know, what he's observing in his uh, in his trend in the especially the, the webinar space. Yeah, sure. I mean, we are definitely one of the happy few. Uh, to give you like a quick glimpse of what happened on our end, uh, essentially, we since the beginning of the lockdown, we tripled revenue just in two months, and you know that's actually something that is quite you know remarkable given the fact that we were a series a company so pretty not advanced but i'll say not a seed company so actually quite uh, quite advanced uh, in a way so we tripled revenue um you know increases in just if, if i'm just going to take like webinar the webinar use case we had like 500 uh, yes 500 percent growth pretty much each month since the beginning of the the crisis so it has this huge impact on, uh, on the way that people communicate, right? So first of all, they were the ones that were actually doing webinar before. And those ones, they had a surge in attendees. They had a surge in demand for, for, for all their own usage, which means that they went from in average like two webinars a month to five to six webinars a month, right? So that was a huge surge. And then for the attendees, it was the same thing. And then you had the ones that were not quite ready to go like full remote or full, video conferencing and you know in a bro in a general way and you know with the crisis they had to do something so they had to do to they had to move to to, to that kind of to that kind of tool so and that was a case for most of the clients that we see this case is basically big corporates so let's say for example the banking system they had a lot we actually had a lot of um incoming 
customer requests from you know from banking system and all those kind of corporates and and turns out for them is working really well and then the use cases are really diverse you see like talking to customers or in a way of training customers or just creating content for their customers and so on all but also on an internal way so they have like internal meetings talking to their own you know employees about you know what is going on inside and so on right so it was a lot of different use cases it was really agnostic and um, you would think that it was just like you know marketing or sales driven webinar but it turns out it was a lot of different things and then you have this a third vertical i would say of people actually starting doing webinar which was the one they were not really tied to the video conferencing ecosystem you see that for example uh uh, yoga studio starting to do webinars just for you know because they had to do something and, and keep the business moving right so we see all those kind of business that actually shifted the way to do their business and trying to transform the way to do business to fit into the, the the current crisis so we saw all those aspect which was really interesting and um and as for us you know we as a company, we we already have a huge part of our uh, of our team actually working fully remote. So we had the processes in place. So basically, going like fifty percent remote to one hundred percent remote was not that hard. It was, I think, we're going to talk about the impact. But essentially, the the, the main thing that we're impacted for us was obviously revenue, which was which is always a good thing. But you know, with that comes a lot of downsides. The first one is you have to to um, to scale up. So you have to scale your infrastructure, you have to scale your team, mostly the service team, for example, customer service and sales, which, you know, obviously you don't scale those teams like you would scale servers. It doesn't take like 24 hours. You have to actually, you know, hire and then put new processes in place and stuff. So that's another challenge that we still have right now. But for the rest is, is, is all right. We, I think the, the, the point that Lionel did is, you know, uh, having like, um, uh, a flexible infrastructure, something that is cloud-based, is really good because it enables you to actually, you know, face that kind of surge, that kind of spike, really easily because it's so flexible. Actually, so that that, that was a, that was a good point. But for the rest, it's it's all hiring, and obviously it takes time. But you know, it, it's starting to to pay out. So yeah, and. I think the last thing is uh, webinar is one thing people used to do webinar before. Now they are actually doing more webinars because it scales really well. Video conferencing is under the one. So typically a meeting that you do internally. And we had this also this um, this meeting product. So we had a webinar product and a meeting product. And the meeting product, we actually offered that for free during the crisis. And uh, we saw a huge surge uh, of that as well. And But the, both are really complementary. And I would say that you know, I, I think everything is tied together. So it's, you start doing webinars and then you just, or maybe it's the other way around, you start doing meetings and then webinars, but you cannot like, you know, separate both uh, from the um, from the use case. So it's it's fairly interesting. Um, and yeah, and that's pretty much it for us, <laughs> essentially. Okay, th thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, and obviously I've got a, Definitely over the last uh, six weeks, you know, all organization, especially kind of running those uh, online events, which is something we always wanted to do, uh, but like we know kind of are doing, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, I think no, there is an element where, you know, when you've done it, then um you know you won't probably go back uh in 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 the past way of doing things even though we really really hope uh you know we'll be able to um have physical networking events uh pretty soon and uh, enjoy having a you know a drink or you know coffee or if it's a kind of a breakfast uh, uh meeting so thank, thanks so much for that and I me mean, just for uh you know to continue uh to go around the the trends uh, i'll get a chance to uh and Ray uh, to talk to us about you know the uh, uh, also the um, the impact on the remote workforce and the telecommunication. I think that was touched earlier as well. Thanks, Leo, and thank you all yeah, for the for the previous answers. And I would say yeah to come back to your point, um, Gilles, Ericle would be part of those companies which were somehow used to run uh, one two webinar per month um, and. Uh, and yeah, just had to adapt pretty fast and started doing 
15 webinars webinar a month. Uh, so, so we're quite heavy on, on, on making sure that basically our customers across the world, Oracle today is a, as a company, is a company that services customers really across the world. I mean, our Australian market, our Australian number of customers is more or less as big as the one in France or the UK. So we're really everywhere. And, and webinars have been a, an amazing, um, well, channel for us to reach the cost our customers, but also our, our prospects um, in lead generation. So definitely, definitely follow this trend. Um, and to tell you a few few words on what we're observing here, air call um, in the telecommunication space as a phone system. For me, and I'll take a bit of a um, a bit of a step back here and look at the uh, of what Aircall belongs to. And for me, Aircall and Donnell, I think you touched base on this a bit. Aircall belongs to a technical stack um, of a lot of different other softwares. Um, and that's somehow like something that today companies are looking at a lot more. I mean, I was, I was thinking about it this morning. It's crazy the number of softwares that today when an employee arrives in the company has to download and start learning how to use. So this technical stack will often have um, internal communication tool, one of the famous one being Slack. You'll often have a CRM if you're in the sales team. You'll often have a help desk software if you're in the service team. You might have all other types of softwares depending on your team. But in the end, you can easily go up to 10, 15, 20 softwares to download. And this is all your technical stack. And of course, what we've seen with this whole working from home is that the companies, and there are still quite a few which had thought their technical stack not cloud-based, where we're in deep, we're in deep trouble. So, so that's that's kind of like the first big observation. Oracle here, we're definitely part of the technical stack. A phone system is something that each employee somehow needs. Of course, some employees need it more than others. The sales guys, the customer support guys, they are the ones making the phone, the most phone calls. And of course, what we observed here is that some companies were a bit surprised and were a bit like taken by surprise, let's say, when we moved to this working from home and had still their telephony system stuck to their office with uh, actual hardware stuck to their desk. And that's, that's something that for us, of course, was a huge boom, thinking that you could, actually, of course, replace all of this by an app either on your computer or on your phone and continue to deliver the same level of service over the phone and even better thanks to a cloud-based phone system. So that was, that was for us, of course, also an opportunity. Well, sales-wise, we, we saw a huge surge also in, in, new, in new customers, but I believe that this is for Oracle, but that was probably for a lot of the other people in the technical stack, which offer cloud-based softwares in the end. Um, so that's, that's the first point for sure. Secondly, and I think that's a big one, and that's one I've always been, even before the COVID period, the working from home, one I've always been very much fighting for, and maybe one of the main reasons why I joined Aircall at the beginning. For me, it's not only about providing uh, a cloud-based software, that's great. That's more or less today, like it should be a must have. It's not the case, but it should be a must have. For me, what, what, what we've observed is that today you wanna be providing in the B2B world, you wanna be providing to your employees softwares which are intuitive, user-friendly and reliable. And that's where today, today in this space, we're seeing, especially with the working from home, that there is a huge trend in making sure that your employees who are now working from home, who don't have this over the shoulder um, asking for help whenever they have a small question, well, they better have softwares that they actually love using or they actually understand how they, how they work and pretty much um, know how to do most of the actions by themselves. And this has been, for me, a big, yeah, as I said, a, bit, a big um, observation from a long time because I've always felt like in the B2B world, we've always been a bit, or a bit behind. I was in the company world, we've been a bit behind on this. We're used to having, I mean, all of us employees in all of the different companies, we're also individuals when we stop working. And when we're using B2C's app, whether it be on our computer or on our mobile phone, we're used to more or less the best UX and UI, which is on the market. We're all using Uber, Airbnb, um, WhatsApp. I mean, all of those apps have been thought to really work the, the way you want them to work. And I feel like there's been a, a bit of, um, 
uh, lag here on the B2B world in providing softwares which really are intuitive and user-friendly. So this has been a big, big shift. And of course, for, for us, I mean, this has always been a big focus. We wanted to disrupt the whole telephony world, but we wanted to do it in a way that was making the different uh, people making phone calls and companies as a nice task to do because it's actually nice software to use. And finally, like um, having said all of this, um, what we observed, and I think that was one of your one of your question in the end, um, uh, Leo, is are there any differences in adoption regarding Europe or, or Asia Pacific? And well, somehow what we observed is that yes, there is there is a little difference, and this is APAC companies. I would say a lot of Australian companies, may, maybe, are considered, and we observe them to be much more agile. So they actually switch to um, virtual cloud-based phone system way faster. They actually were able to train their workforce way faster. And so we saw, I mean, Yonel, I think in your slide, you mentioned Shippet growing their sales team 20% over the month of April. I'm happy to say Shippet today is, a, is an air cold customer. And I mean, being able to have all of your sales team all of a sudden working from your office and all of a sudden asking them to work from home and be able to continue calling their prospects and closing deals. You want them to be trained very fast. You want them to be using software that they can actually continue as if it was all normal. So that I think is a, is a good example. And in Europe, we may be seeing, well, we looked at time to onboard. It's taking an average a few more days. So that's, uh, that's an interesting difference to, to notice. Fantastic, Andre, and yeah, having uh, helped a number of uh, obviously interna international organizations, especially SaaS company, come to Australia. Uh, you know, it's definitely one of the things we've been observing. <clears throat> you know, it's a very digital friendly market. Uh, you know, like companies like Uber have had like a massive growth. I mean, we've been talking about last mile delivery. I mean, Uber Eats in particular in Australia is kind of killing it at the moment. <clears throat> So really, uh, you know, good, good for you, and uh, really glad for uh, Aircall to uh, to kick so many goals in Australia. Um, basically, you know, we I think we're gonna move to uh, basically, and you touch some of that. So maybe we'll go a bit faster. Maybe one thing, um, uh, one word, and, and for you, uh, Lionel here. You know, how did your organization uh, react? Uh, you know, to this kind of lockdown scenario when the Kind of shit hit the fan eight ten weeks ago um you know obviously uh ovh both in europe and apac what was the impact yeah. for your organization so um for us we have um, so we have offices in asia um so from i mean the early stage of the of the covid pandemic um early feb we had to manage and implement a business continuity plan you know in asia pacific um we have also a lot of international travel in the company so that's why um, it was a concern i mean uh, end, of, end of january early feb and very quickly we decided to extend um, to other location to all the other um, ovh offices before the lockdown so i think if i'm right early march uh, almost all the offices around the world for ovh uh, was working from home more than 2,000 people uh, weeks before uh, the official lockdowns. And we define it internally, um, I mean, three uh, priorities for, for, for the edge. The first one, like I think for each company is to guarantee the health and safety of, for teams, of employers, uh, and be sure that they are um, able to work from home. And uh, the second part was how we can, um, I mean, ensure um, the service continuity for the customers, um, that the, the support team, the customer support was able just to, to answer and to and to support requests uh, as usual. Uh, but the same um, in the data centers, uh, manage the servers, uh, manage, I mean, the, the production on the day to day physically. And, um, and the last one was, um, this was very, very important for VH, be part um, of what we call the, I mean, the, the open initiative, we, the open solidarity. Um, so it started, I mean, in response to um, multiple uh, call to action from local government around the world, um, like, a, like a collective uh, initiative where uh, right now we have 40, so it's leading by OVH, but we have more than 40 companies that uh, provide, I mean, free uh, solution application to manage the crisis, uh, especially on the healthcare or on, on the telecommunication. And that's something that it was very, very important for us to, um, to, to focus on the, on the open solidarity for mainly in Europe. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Lionel. Ali, you want to, to comment on the impact maybe for Artesian? 
between your operations and, and maybe what you've seen across your portfolio uh, companies? Yeah, so we, um, we've been working from home for about the last nine or 10 weeks. Um, we were pretty lucky because uh, we're, we're a small-ish team, um, so it's worked pretty well. We've been able to, um, we're on teams, so we've been able to call each other all day, every day. Um, so the transition, I guess, it wasn't that difficult to, to move our operations um, remote. I guess we found it a little difficult, um, particularly when you're meeting a founder for the first time, to get that sort of uh, emotional connection with the founder um, that, that you typically can get in person. It's a, it's a little harder, so it takes a little, a little bit more time to, um, to generate that relationship. Um, I guess we, we put um, in place uh, resources for all of our portfolio companies around all the grants that are available, um, all, all the different, um, what, what different VCs are writing about, um, you know, supporting founder mental health during this time. Um, we did a survey for all of our portfolio companies to understand um, the impact on revenue runway costs um, across the portfolio. Um, we released that is it's on our website. I don't want to quote some of the numbers in case I get it wrong, but um, it's on our blog if anyone wants to check it out. Um, so we we reacted uh, pretty quickly, I think, as well because of our um, team in China who'd been working from home since Chinese New Year. Um, so because we have our portfolio in China, and we'd already seen that impact for our team over there as well as the portfolio companies. Um, we were pretty ready when um, when it hit Australia, which was you know, sort of early to mid March, um, and when when we started um, working remotely and and had those social distancing laws put in place, uh, yeah. So so far so good. Um, hoping to get back to the office soon though, which would be nice to see my colleagues in person. All right. So, to, so talking about that, like um, we've just released the the result of the first poll. Uh, thanks thanks for the attendees to uh, to voting, and it's good to see that you know. 70%, you know, kind of have adjusted, uh, you know, quite well and getting used to uh, working from home, uh, while 24% are living their best life. Um, so we'll keep on kind of, with, we have uh, another couple of polls, you know, I'll keep on throwing um, as we continue the, the discussion. Um, so Gilles, uh, maybe if you want to, uh, yeah, say a few words. I mean, you, you mentioned basically you had to, uh, to recruit during this time. Yeah, uh, so I don't know what any any key learning for you in uh, in in this phase. Well, you know, the first one is uh, the thing that we learned that we already had done in the past, which was really useful, is to document all the process that you have in place already. And by having that document documentation, your onboarding is more is smoother. So when you start hiring more people, when there is a surge, then you know things tend to get easier. So that's the first thing that 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 we learned. Second thing is uh, when you get that kind of surge, the first thing to show is, obviously you, you cannot anticipate everything, but you need to be as reactive as possible to put things in place. And uh, regarding the infrastructure, um, if you have a way of, you know, predicting this surge or having as much logs as possible to, you know, get the small signals of surge of things that you're going, the patterns that you're going to, to see that will impact dramatically your infrastructure, then you have to put some stuff in place really early on. Being, a, I know there is a lot of provider out there and I'm sure OVH is part of that as well, but able to, you know, scale down and up based on your needs, your, um, your, um, your instances and servers. And this is typically something that is super useful in that kind of situation, being able to really response, respond automatically, have a lot of automations in place. That is a best way to actually uh, scale infrastructure wise. Second thing that we learn is having a self-service kind of funnel really helps as well. We've been doing, you know, self servers since day one, we have 80% of the customer base abroad. Uh, and we've done nothing but organic growth since, you know, 20, 2016. And we just hired the first sales in, in 2019. And during those three years, everything was done through credit card and everything. So we had a really strong self service funnel. And and the fact that we had this really smooth process of having, you know, 
people can pay. We had like a Stripe and Charge be in place and stuff. So it was really easy for us to absorb money wise, that revenue wise and, and billing wise, this, this kind of volume. So that was another learning for us. As for the, um, as for the customer service, I think one thing that we had in place was all the, 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 the process such as, you know, save replies and automations as much as possible. But one thing that we haven't anticipated is we wanted to do, I think there was, I think that's something that is really, uh, you know, specific to young companies like us. We want to provide the best service, right? We want to, we want to talk to premium customers like we would do to free trials. And so they have like this really awesome experience from end to end. But when it comes to having like triple the customer base in two months, obviously you cannot have the same, I think it's it's hard to have the same intensity on both spectrum, on both end of the spectrum. So in that case, what you need to do is basically you know, prioritize and then you have to put some automations in place for rules, start processing, you know, your support, customer support with tiers, tiers one, tiers two, tier three, who is in charge. And then, you know, it's really basic structuration of your team. For us, this is something we would have done probably by the end of the year, beginning of the next one, but this is something we had to run in, in, in two months. And now it's starting to pay off. But I think my, my learning here is the more you over-engineer before, it might be like, it, it seems maybe overkill, but at the end of the day, it could help you, you know, pass that kind of surges. And, um, and I think my fourth point is actually the really similar to what, um, to what Andre said is actually when we see in the B2B world, this kind of consumerization of the B2B, you have people have expectations in terms of design and UX. And, you know, we use like Instagram Live, Facebook Live, Twitch, and so on. And all those platforms, they are super easy to use. They are super user-friendly. You have a few clicks. And when they go to the, when they have the, when they go to the B2B space, if they haven't done any video conferencing, for example, or maybe they have, I don't know, then they have the same expectations. So, and the fact is, and Andre is right about it, in the B2B space, when it comes to telecommunication, we have this really IT products legacy that has like, Kind of a dated UX, if you ask me, and and people need that kind. Of, they, they they have this new wave of UX coming up, and they expect that. And this is what will drive. This will ease your conversion rate. This will ease the inboarding. So that means less support at the end of the day. That means more conversion, more revenue, more easiness to absorb that kind of volume. So design actually played a strong part in in, in that in that um, way of absorbing things. Um, as for the, um, you know, the cool stuff that we saw for us, I think cool anecdotes that we saw is, we saw, as I said, a lot of different players, you know, starting doing webinars and meetings and everything. It's, it's um, the usual that we had, the usual verticals that we have was, you know, tech companies, universities, and I'll say agencies and consulting groups. That was the three verticals that we had. And with the COVID situation, we saw actually a lot of public organization and governmental organizations starting to use remote tools. I'm sure Aircall has the same one. And, you know, for example, we saw like the French government starting using Livestorm. So it was like, a, it was awesome to see that. You see like an, a, a NHS in the UK starting to, you know, have this, they had this task force called Pan Surge trying to, you know, coordinate like doctors, you know, around the COVID and everything. And they're using live sounds. So it was like super, I don't know, we, we, we felt proud about it, right? So it, it, was, it, it, was a great, it was a great moment for us. So, you know, a lot of different anecdotes like this. So it, it, was, it, was, it was cool. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jules. Uh, do you want to add anything, uh, Andre, in terms of uh, impact? Yeah, or I mean, I'll, I'll definitely relate to, to this 100%. And, and it's, I, I fully, fully agree this, um, this uh, um, feeling of somehow like you you are really helping uh, your your customer or your prospects with your product, um, and especially when those customers become so different than the ones that you were used to. I mean, we've had churches, we've had churches joining, uh, join signing for free trials and uh, understanding how to use air call. I mean, who would have, who would have, who would have thought? Um, so, so that's the, in the French government also, uh, same thing, same here, th same thing, same thing here for air call. That's, that's a, it's definitely a good feeling. It's definitely the kind of things where you feel like your software uh, is going the, the right way. Um, but, I would say here, even without uh, like so the whole, so, and that was something on which Ergol had to adapt big time. Um, and on the customer side, uh, like 
adapt to this new type of customers, but also for our current, for our new prospect, the normal type, I would say. Um, well, also we had to somehow adapt, reviewing our discount policy. I mean, somehow this was a big move and I don't know if there's other many companies in, 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 in this webinar right now who are thinking like, hey, is it still possible to do new sales if you are struggling, if you're not in a business where somehow like it's tough um, to, well, it's, um, it's tough maybe because of the current crisis. Well, we, we even us, we were somehow benefiting. We, we reviewed our discount policy. We knew kind of like we wanted to understand what was the situation right now for our, for our prospect. I mean, you do, never want to undermine the value of the product. You just want to somehow show that as a company, you are understanding towards your customers by maybe postponing, delaying some payments which were due for this month, but also for your prospects to allow them to, to actually continue working, to allow them to have a business continue to plan, to continue to offer as much business as they can and continue to maybe make as much revenue as they can to, to survive basically. So that was that was a big aspect. And I think we, yeah, there were a lot of internal communication, a lot of internal conversation, sorry, um, within within Aircall. And, and honestly, those I think led to some really, really nice initiatives. On the on the other hand, um, I think um, I think yeah, um, Jill, I, I also connect to this one. It's um, somehow you need to when you move when everybody moves remote, you need to be humble here on your on the different processes that you've um, put in place over the last couple of years. Some things maybe you felt like we're super clear, but all of a sudden you need to onboard new people and you have people all of working from home and that was maybe a big shift we internally we had to say like okay what's clear what's not clear and uh, and review all those kind of like um process and uh, and present them the the proper way um otherwise as a as a as a tech company um and i don't know if some other people today in the in the webinar relate to this but even though we are one of the happy few today i would say in terms of um, the impact of the crisis on us we still somehow controlled business hires so that means business hires uh, mainly sales basically sales and account managers uh, we still control this much more i mean we we know we don't know how long the crisis is going to be during so we still kind of like reach out to our board of investors discuss with them and despite the fact that Aircall is a well-funded company we still want to control this um, business those, those business this business team basically but no uh, limit on the tech side basically for us we see it as an opportunity to continue adding uh, more features uh, improving our our technical stack and so continuing to work on the product and somehow keep a bit of control on the on the business side so that, that was also a big a big um, shift in the way we were we were growing thanks thanks so much uh, andre so i think we um we have uh, literally eight minutes left uh there are a few uh very interesting questions that have been asked uh, some of them are actually for uh, Ali. Um, so at, at seven Australia time, uh, actually in, in seven minutes, we have uh, a group session with, uh, with Ali where everyone would be able to ask their own question. So maybe, um, and I know Gilles actually has to go to jump into uh, another uh, webinar. So may take the yeah. opportunity to, uh, to see you uh, goodbye. Yeah, um, webinar life, right. <laughs> see you virtually you know won't be able right. to see each other physically i think probably in 2020 so see you virtually uh very soon again and well done um and long life to life Tom. thank you everyone thank you for having me bye bye cheers have a good day bye uh and so so no yeah maybe in terms of uh, so that's some of the questions that have been asked um so maybe for each of you one thing you know one trend one observation that will last beyond this crisis that will never be like before. Ali. Um, I think we've, I mean, we've touched on a lot of them. I think, I think mass adoption um, and um, the pace of uh, companies, um, the pace of innovation um, will, will, um, hopefully stay beyond COVID. So I think that we'll we'll see that a lot of companies that I've even seen in my own portfolio, they had something on their product roadmap in 24 months and they're doing it now. 
because they had to and because so I think um you know, hopefully we'll have an increased pace of innovation in terms of um, stickiness within a sector. Uh, I think supply, um, last mile delivery, I think some of that will drop off. Um, I think people will want to go back to shops. So I think that the demand for that, you know, will actually decrease. Um, and in terms, I think though, in terms of um, B2B, sort of SaaS platforms, automation within the corporation, those will become really sticky and those will stay beyond just um, right now. Okay, thanks, Ali. So the pace of innovation will remain high. Yonel, for mm -hmm. you. You're on mute, Yonel. This thing is, yeah. What I think is that should um, we should not expect, I mean, anything from the corporate or enterprise world, you know. And um, I think the, the very good point is that there is a lot of opportunity in front of us. Um, I strongly believe that uh, for, for everyone, for each, each of we want what we really want to do, you know. And um, I, I agree with, with Ali that uh, the after crisis uh, will see a new uh, generation of entrepreneurs. And not only in the tech, not only in the tech industry, I think we're losing you, Lionel. Um, um, I don't know if you're able to, to hear me, if it's working. No, we lost you. Yeah, it's working. Is it? OK. All right. So maybe let's jump to uh, Andre. Sorry about this, Lionel. Yeah, we couldn't hear. Okay. Andre? Uh, I mean, w what I can feel here in Australia is that the, the people um, <laughs> You tell me, Leo. Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, I go, can go for it. I think we lost. Yeah. Uh, we lost Lionel. Sorry about this. And there was. Fine. We'll, we'll, we'll see if he is able to reconnect afterwards. Um, well, I think we. If the, the, this has been one initiative which was brought up by by the HR team, which I which I particularly. Uh, like during this crisis. And I think it showed a lot uh, within the company. It was called the one team project. And what it means is that basically during this, during this crisis, um, definitely some uh, functions within the company um, had less work. Um, and instead of um, letting go people or instead of um, uh, somehow, uh, yeah, putting them on pause, which is something you can do in France, uh, the HR team uh, wanted to use this moment to strengthen the understanding of the other functions within the company. So some people, let's say, for instance, in the in the recruitment, uh, we had some we have some internal talent um, talent hunters uh, at Aircall. Well, because we said that we would really more control now the, the number of hires on the business side, be a bit more conservative here. Well, they had a lot less work. Well, we in, we used this moment to actually saw if there was any other project in any other teams um, where they could help. And this really worked. This really worked. We saw some people from the tech side coming on the business side or some people from the business side coming from the tech side helping on some small projects. And I think the overall learning here has been that, yeah, as a, in, in tough periods like this, we're actually um, using this maybe a free time for some people to make the whole company stronger because afterwards, this whole knowledge across departments will be super helpful. So that, that was, I think, a nice, uh, nice, nice learning here. Fantastic. Thanks for, uh, for sharing that. It's a, uh, it's, it's, uh... Very good learning. Uh, I mean, something we are definitely uh, try, trying to apply in our organization uh, that has been shaped um, a bit as well, uh, you know, by a number of change. So including um, the closure of the international border, you know, for Australians we, where, you know, international talent acquisition and, you know, helping, you know, companies like uh, Aircall to actually land in Australia, you know, open their, their office, uh, you know, but similarly, actually, um, We've never been uh, as busy on the on the talent acquisition front, and you know, kind of rethinking, uh, you know, a number of our solutions um, that are you know being even more compelling uh, at the moment. Uh, so fantastic! So thanks, thanks so much, uh, everyone, for all your time. 
Uh, so we'll keep uh, Ali for um, for a, kind of a private session for some of our uh, members. Um, there were, you know, a number of uh, kind of I think question. Hopefully, most of them have been covered, and the one uh, for Ali will be covered in the next session. Um, you know, I hope you know all your uh, French and European guests enjoy the session and and will be uh, joining our, our community. Uh, you know, we'll be here. You know, if you want to uh, come to uh, at least virtually to uh, to the Australian and Asia Pacific market, uh, reach out to uh, to us. Um, I think, yeah, I've got. Uh, you know, I, won't, I, I will uh, save uh, this time uh, for the slide. And a big, big thanks to uh, all our partners, obviously, um, uh, our friends from OVH Cloud. Uh, you know, Lionel, but also Clément, Yan Ling, and all the all their team, uh, Axelio, uh, Quentin, was online, Artesian, uh, you know, who's been also uh, coming and investing time, uh, you know, within our, our community. Uh, and of course, you know, Andre and, and Jill, you know, uh, coming in, uh, in Paris. So fantastic. Stay in touch. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, and see you, see you at our next event. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Leo. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Leo. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.